181. Much time was spent in making clear by example as well, as by teaching what would be the effect in the astral world of a certain mode of life on Earth. In the first place they taught by illustrations, on an extensive scale by representations. In the temples, by a kind of play or drama, in which was shown what, in the astral world, would be the condition of a man, who had been, let us say, avaricious or full of sensual desires. In the old days of the mysteries, when the leaders were adepts or pupils of adepts, these representations were something like materializations. That is to say, the teacher, whoever he was, produced them by his own power out of astral or etheric matter, and created a real image for his pupils. But as time advanced, and later teachers were unable to bring about this phenomenon, they tried to represent these teachings in other ways, in some cases by what we should call acting. Members of the priesthood took the roles of different persons, while in other cases puppets were moved by machinery. 182. In addition to the teaching concerning the astral plane, instructions were also given in the same way, as to the system of world evolution. Among other things, pupils were taught how our solar system, and its different parts came into existence. You can easily see how that could be represented, first by materialized nebulae, and globes, and how. When this materialization was no longer possible, the arrangement of different globes could be made clear by the use of what we now call an orrery, that is, a model of the solar system. 183. One of the most important things connected with the mysteries was that they explained the outer religion of the people in quite another way, and that given to the general public, if you know anything about the religion of ancient Greece, you will understand that there were many things which badly needed some inner explanation, for certainly their religion does not appear to be very elevated or very reasonable when looked at from the ordinary standpoint. It seems to have been the object that all the stories which made up the outer teaching, many of which seem very extraordinary, should be learned by the people and retained in their minds, just a few simple, clear conceptions, and nothing more. But all earnest-minded people joined the mysteries, and learned there the real meaning of the stories, which gave the whole thing quite another aspect. 184. Let me give you an idea of what I mean, by two or three very simple, and short examples. I told you that, for the most part, the aim of those lesser mysteries was to inform the pupils about the effects on the astral plane of a certain mode of life here on Earth. You probably know the myth of Dantilus. He was a man condemned to suffer in hell eternal thirst, while water surrounded him on all sides, but receded from his lips as soon as he tried to drink. The meaning of this is not difficult to see when once we know what the astral life is. Everyone who leaves this world of ours full of sensual desires of any kind, as, for example, a drunkard, or someone, who has given himself up to sensual living in the ordinary meaning of the word, such a man finds himself on the astral plane, in the position of Dantilus. 185. He has built up for himself this terrible desire which governs his whole being. Do you know how powerful the desire can be in the case of a drunkard? It conquers his feelings of honor, his love of his family, and all the better inclinations of his character. He will take money from his wife and children, will even take their clothes to sell them, and obtain money to drink. 186. Remember, that when a man dies he does not change at all. His desire is still as powerful as ever. But it is impossible to gratify it because his physical body, through which only he could drink, is gone. There you have your Dantilus, as you see, 
full of that terrible desire, always finding that the gratification recedes as soon as he thinks he has it. 187. Recall also the story of Tutias, the man, who was tied to a rock, his liver being gnawed by vultures, and growing again as fast as it was eaten. There you have an illustration of the effect of yielding to desire. An image of the man, who is always tortured by remorse for sins committed on earth. 188. As perhaps a higher example of the same we can take the story of Sisyphus. Do you know how he was condemned always to roll a stone up a hill, and how, when he reached the top, the stone would always roll down again? That is the condition of an ambitious man after death, a man who has spent his life in making plans for selfish ends, for attaining glory or honor. In his case also death brings no change. He goes on making plans just as he did during life. He works out his plans, he executes them, as he thinks, till the point of culmination and then he suddenly perceives that he has no longer a physical body, and that all was but a dream. Then he begins again, and again, till he has learned at last that these desires are useless, and that ambition must be killed. So Sisyphus goes on uselessly rolling the stone up the hill, till at last he learns not to roll a ten e more. To have learned that is to have conquered that desire and he will come back in his next life, without it, without the desire, but of course not without the weakness of character which made that desire possible. 189. So you see that conditions that seem terrible are but the effects in the other world of a wrong life here on earth. That is nature's method of turning wrong into good. Man does suffer but what he suffers is only the effect of his own action, and nothing else, it is not punishment inflicted upon him from outside, but entirely of his own making. And that is not all. The suffering he has to bear is the only means by which his qualities can be directed in the right way for his evolution and progress in another life. This was a point much emphasized in the teaching of the mysteries. 190. Now in regard to the greater mysteries. Those were celebrated principally in the great temple of Eleusis, not far from Athens. The initiates were named Epoptite, that is, they whose eyes are opened. Their emblem was the golden fleece of Jason which is the symbol of the mind-body, for the yellow color in the human aura indicates the intelligence, as every clairvoyant knows, in this degree of initiation the teachings of the former degree were continued. In the first, as you remember, were taught the effects in the astral world of various ways of living. In the greater mysteries the pupil was shown what would be the effect in the heaven world of a certain line of life, study, and aspiration on earth. The whole history of the evolution of the world, and of man, in its deeper aspect, was expounded in the greater mysteries. The same method or representation, as in the other case was used here, although it was much more difficult to represent on the physical plane what belonged to the mental. 191. In each of these divisions of the mysteries, the lesser and the greater, there was an inner school which taught practical development to those who were seen to be ready for it. In the lesser mysteries theoretical knowledge about the astral plane was given, but the teachers carefully watched their pupils, and when they noticed one of whose character they felt sure, who showed that he was capable of psychic development, they invited him into the inner circle, in which instruction was given as to the method of using the astral body, and consciously functioning in it. When such a man passed on to the greater mysteries he received not only the ordinary teaching about the conditions of the mental plane, but also private instruction as to the development of the mental body as a vehicle. 192. 
those who were thus received, not only into the recognized stages of the mysteries, but into their inner schools, were also taught at the end of their course, that all of this was in truth, but exoteric, that all which they had learned, incalculable, as had been its value, was really only a preparation for the true mysteries of initiation which would lead them to the feet of the masters of wisdom, and admit them to the great brotherhood which rules the world. 193. I may explain still further the meaning of some of those symbols which were used in connection with the mysteries. First, we will take what was called the thyrsus, that is, a staff with a pine cone on its top. In India the same symbol is found, but instead of the staff is to cut bamboo with seven knots is used. In some modifications of the mysteries, a hollow iron rod, said to contain fire, was used instead of the thyrsus. Here again it is not difficult for the student of occultism to see the meaning. The staff or the stick with seven knots represents the spinal cord with its seven centers, of which we read in the Hindu books. The hidden fire is the serpent fire, Kundalini, of which you may read in the secret doctrine. But the thyrsus was not only a symbol, it was also an object of practical use. It was a very strong magnetic instrument, used by initiates to free the astral body from the physical when they passed in full consciousness to this higher life. The priest who had magnetized it laid it against the spinal cord of the candidate and gave him in that way some of his own magnetism to help him in that difficult life and in the efforts which lay before him. In connection with these mysteries, a certain set of objects called the toys of Bacchus are spoken of. When you go over those lists of the toys of Bacchus you will find them very remarkable. 194. Whilst the child Bacchus, the Logos, plays with his toys he is seized by the Titans and torn to pieces. Later these pieces are put together and built into a whole. You will understand that this, however clumsy it may seem to us, is without doubt an allegory which represents the descending of the One, to become the Many, and the reunion of the Many and the One, through suffering and sacrifice. What, then, are the toys of the child Bacchus when he falls into matter, and becomes the Many? In the first place we find him playing with dice. Those dice are not common dice, but the five platonic solids, a set of five regular figures, the only regular polygons possible in geometry. They are given in a fixed series, and this series agrees with the different planes of the solar system. Each of them indicates, not the form of the atoms of the different planes, but the lines along which the power works which surrounds those atoms. These polygons are the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. If we put the point at one end, and the sphere at the other we get a set of seven figures, corresponding to the number of planes of our solar system. 195. Do you know, that in some of the older schools of philosophy it was said, no one can enter who does not know mathematics? What do you think is meant by that? Not what we now call mathematics, but the mathematics which embrace the knowledge of the higher planes, of their mutual relations, and the way in which the whole is built by the will of God. Plato said, God geometrizes, and it is perfectly true. Those forms are not conceptions of the human brain, they are truths of the higher planes. We have formed the habit of studying the books of Euclid, but we study them now for themselves, and not as a guide to something higher. The old philosophers pondered upon them because they led to the understanding of the true science of life. We have lost sight of the true teaching, and grasp in many cases only the lifeless form. 196. 
Another toy with which Bacchus played was a top, the symbol of the whirling atom of which you will find a picture in occult chemistry. He also plays with a ball which represents the Earth, that particular part of the planetary chain to which the thought of the Logos is specially directed at the moment. Also he plays with a mirror. The mirror has always been a symbol of astral light, in which the archetypal ideas are reflected, and then materialized. So you see, that each of those toys indicates an essential part in the evolution of a solar system. 197. A few words may be said about the way in which people were prepared for the study of those mysteries by the different schools, for instance, the Pythagorean school, to which I belonged. In the Pythagorean schools, the pupils were divided into three classes. The first was called that of the Akkaus to Koi or Hearers. This means that they were learners, but it is also true that one of the rules was that they were to keep absolutely silent for two years. 198. I think this rule would be regarded as a serious drawback by many who join our society at the present time, but in those olden times a great many people, not only men but women too, submitted to this stipulation. The rule had also another meaning, but it is a fact that during two years the members of the first class were compelled to keep silence. The other meaning was that during all the time, however long, that a man stayed in this class of the Akaus to Kod, he might not give out any teaching, but continued to learn. I have wished that we had some such arrangement in the Theosophical Society, for it sometimes happens that members, who do not yet know much themselves want to teach others, and the teaching is not always recognizable as Theosophy. 199. The second class of Pythagoreans was called that of the Mathematicoi. They passed their time in studying geometry, numbers, and music. They brought these different subjects into relation to one another, and worked out the relations between color and sound, which are very remarkable. 200. Let us take an example, which shows how our world is a coherent whole, and how we can take from different parts which do not seem to have any connection whatever and bring them into relation with each other. I just spoke about the five platonic polygons. Everyone who knows anything about music knows that there is a fixed proportion between the length of the strings which produce certain tones. You know that you can tune a piano according to a certain system of fifths, and you can express the relation of the different tones to one another by the number of vibrations of each tone so you can express an harmonious chord in mathematical numbers. This was first discovered simply by experiment, later the mathematicians found out what the proportions should be, and again by experiment they were found to be exact. But the peculiarity is that the set of numbers which produces an harmonious chord have the same relation to one another, as that which exists between certain parts of these platonic solids. I believe that this point was worked out some time ago in an article in the Theosophical Review, by one of the English cathedral organists. 201. It is very remarkable that our scale, so different from the old Greek scale, which consisted of five tones, can still be deduced from the proportion of those five platonic figures, which were studied some thousands of years ago in Greece. One is apt to think that there cannot be much relation between mathematics and music, but you see that they are both parts of one great whole. 202. The third class of the Pythagorean school was formed of the physicoi, those who studied physics, the interconnection between phenomena, world building and metaphysics. They learned the truth about man and nature, and, as far, as they could learn it, about him, who made both. 203. 
there is still one point in the mysteries which we should not forget to consider. The life of the disciples. A life of perfect purity was strictly required. It is a remarkable coincidence that the life in the Pythagorean school is divided into five periods, almost similar to the five steps of the preparatory path of the Hindus, as described by me in Invisible Helpers, and by Mrs. Besant in The Path of Discipleship. Almost all the forms and symbols of the present Christian religion are derived from the Egyptian mysteries. All the symbolism, for example, that is related to the Latin cross, and to the descent and sacrifice of the Logos, is taken from the Egyptian mysteries. I have written about this in the Christian Creed. 204. Though the mysteries of Greece and Rome, of Egypt and Chaldea, are long ago defunct, the world has never been left without avenues of approach to the inner shrine. Even in the gross darkness of the Middle Ages the Rosicrucians and some other secret societies were ready to teach the truth to those who were ready to learn, and now in these modern days of hurry and materialism the Theosophical Society still upholds the banner of true knowledge and acts as a gateway by means of which those who are really in earnest may reach the feet of the Masters of the Wisdom. We have our grades in the esoteric section, just as the mysteries had, and behind us, as behind them, stand always the officials of the Great White Brotherhood, who keep in their hands the key to the true initiations. 205. You must also remember that many things given in those old days only under the seal of secrecy are now made public, and through our society are given to the world. Many of the greatest and noblest characters of history have passed years in study and work to try to find what is now given us so easily, and simply in a few books. Of us is perfectly true what is said in the Bible. Many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Luke X 24 because this honor is reserved for us, and this opportunity is given us, it seems to me that a great responsibility rests upon us, and that we should try to be worthy of the gift. It is good karma which allows this possibility to open before us if we let it pass. We shall not deserve to have another offered us for thousands of years. If you knew, as I know, with what difficulties we had to contend in former days to learn all those things which are laid before us now, perhaps you would appreciate more the opportunity offered you. Let us try to make use of it to the utmost of our power and show ourselves worthy of the privilege given us by Theosophy. 206 Second Section 207 208 Religion. 209. Second section. 210. The Logos. 211. We have in the Logos of our solar system, as near an approach to a personal, or rather, perhaps, individual, God, as any reasonable man can desire. For of him is true everything good that has ever been predicated of a personal deity. We cannot describe to him partiality, injustice, jealousy, cruelty. Those who desire these attributes in their deity must go elsewhere. But so far as his system is concerned he possesses omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, the love, the power, the wisdom, the glory, all are there in fullest measure. Yet he is a mighty individual, a trinity in unity, and God, in very truth, though removed by we know not how many stages from the absolute, the unknowable, before which even solar systems are, but has specks of cosmic dust. I do not think that we can image him at all. The sun is his chief manifestation on the physical plane, and that may help us a little to realize some of his qualities. 
and to see how everything comes from him. The sun may be considered as a sort of force center in him, corresponding to the heart of man, the outer manifestation of the principal center in his body. 212. Although the whole solar system is his physical body, yet his activities outside of it are enormously greater than those within it. I have myself preferred not even to try to make any image of him, but simply to contemplate him, as pervading all things, so that even I myself am also he, so that all other men too are he, and in truth there is nothing but God. Yet at the same time, although this that we can see is a manifestation of him, the solar system, that seems so stupendous to us as to him, but a little thing, for, though he is all this, yet outside it and above it all he exists in a glory, and a splendor of which we know nothing as yet. Thus though we agree with the pantheist, that all is God, we yet go very much further than he does, because we realize that he has a far greater existence, above and beyond his universe. Having pervaded this whole universe with one fragment of myself, I remain. Bhagavad Gita, X42, 213. I do not think that we can find any form of words that will at all express the method of our union with him. We may in one sense be cells in his body, but we are certainly very much more than that, for his life and power are manifested through us in a way which is out of all proportion to any such manifestation of our spiritual life as could be supposed to be given through the cells of our bodies. In his manifestation on the lowest cosmic plane we may take it, that his first aspect is on the highest level, the second on that below it, and the third in the higher part of the nirvanic plane, so that when an adept gradually raises his consciousness plane by plane, as he develops, he comes first to the third aspect, and realizes his unity with that moving on only after long intervals to full union with the second and the first. 214. I myself who speak to you have once seen him, in a form which is not the form of his system. This is something which utterly transcends all ordinary experience, which has nothing to do with any of the lower planes. The thing became possible for me only through a very daring experiment, the utter blending for a moment of two distinct rays or types, so that by means of this blending a level could for a moment be touched enormously higher than any to which either of the egos concerned could have attained alone. He exists far above his system. He sits upon it as on a lotus throne. He is, as it were, the apotheosis of humanity yet infinitely greater than humanity. We might think of the object as carried up higher and higher, and to infinity. I do not know whether that form is permanent, or whether it can be seen at a certain level only, who shall say. But that this thing is a tremendous reality, that I know, and, once seen, such a manifestation can never be forgotten. 215. One little touch of higher experience I may mention, though it is one which is exceedingly difficult to describe adequately. When a man raises his consciousness to the highest subdivision of his casual body, and focuses it exclusively in the atomic matter of the mental plane, he has before him three possibilities of moving that consciousness, which correspond to some extent with the three dimensions of space. Obviously a way is open to him to move it downwards into the second subplane of the mental, or upward into the lowest subplane of the budhik, if he has developed that sufficiently to be able to utilize it as vehicle. 216. A second line of movement open to him is the shortcut which exists from the atomic subdivision of one plane, to the corresponding atomic subdivisions of the planes above and below.
so that without touching any intermediate subplane the consciousness may pass from that atomic mental downwards to the atomic astral or upwards to the atomic bud kick, again of course supposing the development of this latter to be already achieved. In order to image to oneself this shortcut, one may think of the atomic subplanes as being side by side along a rod, the other subdivisions of each plane hanging from the rod in loops, as though a piece of string were wound loosely round the rod. Obviously then to pass from one atomic subdivision to another one could move by the shortcut straight along the rod or down and up again through the hanging loop of string which symbolizes the lower subplanes. But there is yet a third possibility, a possibility not so much yet of movement along another line at right angles to both of these others, but rather a possibility of looking up such a line looking up as a man at the bottom of a well might look up at a star in the sky, above him. 217. For there is a direct line of communication between the atomic subplane of the mental in this lowest cosmic plane, and the corresponding atomic mental in the cosmic plane. We are infinitely far as yet from being able to climb upwards by that line. But once at least the experience came of being able to look up it for a moment. What is seen then it is hopeless to try to describe, for no human words can give the least idea of it, but at least this much emerges, with a certitude, that can never be shaken, that what we have hitherto supposed to be our consciousness, our intellect, is simply not ours at all, but his, not even a reflection of his, but literally, and truly a part of his consciousness, a part of his intellect. Incomprehensible, yet literally true. It is a commonplace of our meditation, to say, I am that self, that self am I, but to see it, to know it, to feel it, to realize it in this way, is something very different from that verbal recitation. 218. From him comes forth all life in the successive outpourings which are described in our books, the first outpouring from his third aspect, which gives to previously existing atoms the power to aggregate themselves into the chemical elements, the action which is described in the Christian scriptures, as the Spirit of God moving over the waters of space. When, at a later stage, the kingdoms of nature are definitely established, there comes the second outpouring, from his second aspect, which forms group souls, for the minerals, the plants, the animals, and this is the descent of the Christ principle into matter, which alone renders possible our very existence. But when we think of the human kingdom we remember that the ego itself is a manifestation of the third outpouring which comes from his first aspect, the eternal and all-loving Father. 219. Every fixed star is a sun like our own, and each one is a partial expression of a logos. 220. 221. Buddhism. 222. In thinking of the Lord Buddha we must not forget that he is very much more than merely the founder of religion. He is a great official of the occult hierarchy, the greatest of all save one, and the founder and previous incarnations of many religions, before this one which now bears his title. For he was the Vidasa who has done so much for the Indian religion, he was Hermes, the great founder of the Egyptian mysteries, he was the original Zoroaster, from whom came the sun and fire worship, and he was also Orpheus, the great bard of the Greeks. 223. In this last of his many births, when he came, as the Lord Gautama, it does not appear that he had originally any intention of founding a new religion. He appeared simply as a reformer of Hinduism, a faith which was already of hoary antiquity, and had therefore departed much from its original form, as all religions have. It had become hardened in many ways, 
and appears to have been very far less elastic even than it is now. Even now we all know how strictly drawn are the lines between the castes, what an iron rigidity there is as to forms and ceremonies. We know that even now no man can be converted to Hinduism, the only way to enter that faith is to be born into it. 224. Imagine a condition in which all this was even far more rigid, in which the feeling was much more intense, in which all the ideas of life had been very much changed from what they were in the days of the original Aryan immigrants, when it was a religion full of joy and holding out hope for everybody. A little before the time of the Buddha the general opinion seems to have been that practically no one but a Brahmin had any chance of salvation at all. Now as the number of the Brahmins was always small, and even now is only something like 13 millions, out of the 300 million inhabitants of India, it was clearly not a very hopeful religion for the majority of the people since it indicated to them that they had to work on through very many lives until they could earn admission into the small and exclusive Brahmin caste before they could possibly escape from the wheel of birth and death. 225. Then came Lord Buddha and by his teaching flung open wide the gates of the sweet law of justice for he taught that men had departed entirely from the old form of religion. He repeatedly asserted that a man, who, though born a Brahmin, did not live the life which a Brahmin should, was neither worthy of respect, nor in the way of salvation, and that a man of any other caste, who did live the true Brahmin life, should be treated, as a Brahmin, and had in every way the same possibilities, before him as though he had been born into the sacred caste. 226. Naturally enough in the face of teachings which placed all hope of final salvation so indefinitely far away in the future, the ordinary man of the world had become hopeless and consequently careless. On the other hand, the austerity of the Brahman, who spent the whole of his life in ceremonies and in meditation, was not to their taste and indeed was obviously impossible for them. But the Buddha preached to them what he called the middle way. He told them that although the life of austerity and of entire devotion to religion was not for them, there was no reason why, because of that, they should relapse into carelessness and evil living. He showed them that a higher life is possible for the man still in the world and that, though they might not be able to devote themselves to metaphysics, and to hair-splitting arguments, they could still obtain sufficient grasp of the great facts of evolution to form a satisfactory guide to them in their lives. 227. He declared that extremes in either direction are equally irrational, that on the one hand the life of the ordinary man of the world, wrapped up entirely in his business, pursuing dreams of wealth and power, is foolish and defective, because it leaves out of account all that is really worthy of consideration, but that on the other hand the extreme asceticism, that teaches each man, to turn his back upon the world altogether, and to devote himself exclusively, and selfishly to the endeavor to shut himself away from it and escape from it, is also foolish, he held that the middle path of truth and beauty is the best and safest, and that while certainly the life devoted entirely to spirituality is the highest of all for those who are ready for it, there is also a good and true and spiritual life possible for the man, who yet holds his place, and does his work in the world. 228. He based his doctrine solely on reason and common sense. He asked no man to believe anything blindly, but rather told him to open his eyes and look around him. He declared that in spite of all the sorrow and misery of the world, the great scheme of which man is a part is a scheme of eternal justice, and that the law under which we are living is a good law and needs only that we should understand it and adapt ourselves to it. 
He taught that all life is suffering, but that man causes his own trouble for himself because he yields himself perpetually to desire for that which he has not, and he said that happiness and contentment can be gained better by limiting desires than by increasing possessions. 229. To this end he tabulated his teaching in the most marvelous manner, arranging everything under certain headings which could be readily memorized. This constitutes in reality a carefully graded system of mnemonics. It is so simple in its broad outline that any child can remember and understand its four noble truths, its noble eightfold path, and the principles of life which they suggest, yet it is carried out so elaborately that it constitutes a system of philosophy which the wisest man may study all his life through, and yet find in it ever more and more light upon the problems of life. 230. He analyzed everything to an almost incredible extent, as may be seen by a study of the twelve nidanas, or by his enumeration of the steps which intervene between thought and action. Each of his four noble truths is represented by a single word, and yet to anyone who has ever heard the exposition of the system each of those words inevitably calls up a great range of ideas. The same thing is true of the words signifying the steps of the noble eightfold path, and of the great perfections which are spoken of in the voice, of the silence. All of these perfections are simply wisdom, power, and love appearing in different forms. They are sometimes reckoned as six, but more commonly as ten. The six are given as perfect charity, perfect morality, perfect patience, perfect energy, perfect truth, and perfect wisdom, and the other four which are sometimes added are perfect resignation, perfect resolution, perfect kindness, and perfect abnegation. 231. The religion of Buddhism has practically disappeared from India, yet it has left behind it lasting results, and the country bears everywhere the strong impress of his teachings. Before his coming blood sacrifices appear to have been universal, even now they still exist, but are comparatively rare, for he taught that such things were not pleasing to any noble deity, but that the gods desired rather the sacrifice of a holy life. 232. In looking back upon the record of those times we see that he preached mostly in the open air, and nearly always sitting at the foot of a tree, with the listeners sitting on the ground about him, or standing leaning against the trees, men and women intermingling, and little children running about and playing upon the outskirts of the crowd. The great teacher had the most wonderful voice gloriously full and sonorous, and a personality which instantly commanded the attention of all who heard him, and invariably won their hearts, even in the rare cases, where they did not agree with what he said. The audiences were stirred up to great religious fervor, we find them constantly raised in cries of sadhu, sadhu, by way of applause, when anything was said which especially moved them, and at the same time raising their joined hands, in an attitude of salutation. 233. Pert at least of this influence was due to the tremendously strong vibrations of his aura, which was of very great size, so that the audience were actually sitting within it and being attuned to it while they listened to his discourse, its magnetic effect was almost indescribable, and while his hearers were within its influence even the most stupid of them could understand to the full whatever he said, though often afterwards when they had passed away from that influence they found it difficult to comprehend it at all in the same way. To this marvelous influence also is due the phenomenon so often described in the Buddhist books, the attainment of the arhat level by such large numbers of his hearers. It is quite a common thing to read in the accounts given in the Buddha scriptures 
that after a sermon of the Buddha hundreds of men, even thousands, reached the arhat level. Knowing what a very high degree of attainment this means, this seemed to us, when we read it, almost incredible, and we supposed it to be simply a case of oriental exaggeration, but later and closer study has shown us that the accounts are actually true. So remarkable a result seemed to call for further investigation into its causes, and we found that in order to understand all this it was necessary to take into account not this one life only, but the work of many previous incarnations. 234. We must remember that the Lord Gautama is the Buddha of the four fruit race, even though this last incarnation of his was taken in the fifth. He had been born many times in various Atlantean races, and always, as a great teacher. In each of those lives he had drawn around him many pupils who had gradually been raised to higher levels of thought, and of life, and when he came in India, for this last culminating birth he arranged that all those whom at many different times, and in many different lands he had influenced should be brought together into incarnation at the same time. Thus his audiences were to a large extent composed of fully prepared, and, as it were, highly specialized souls. And when these came under the influence of the extraordinarily powerful magnetism of a Buddha, they understood and followed every word which he said and the action upon them as he goes was of the most wonderfully stimulating nature. Therefore it was that they so readily responded, therefore it was that so large a number of them could be, and were raised so rapidly to such dizzy heights. 235. In the third volume of The Secret Doctrine we shall find an exceedingly interesting and suggestive section called The Mystery of Buddha which refers to the fact that the Buddha prepared his own inner bodies of very high grades of matter with the fullest development of the spirally. His budhik, causal and mental bodies are kept together for other great owns to use because of the exceeding difficulty of producing others equal to them. The Christ used them along with the physical body of Jesus while the latter waited on higher planes in his own vehicles. Shankaracharya also used these remains. Hence arose the incorrect idea that he was a reincarnation of the Buddha. The coming Christ will also use these vehicles, wedding them to another physical body which is even now being prepared for him. 236. Buddhism still claims a larger number of adherents than any other religion in the world and is a living influence in the lives of millions of our fellow men. It would be quite unfair to judge it by what is written about it by European Orientalists. When I was in Ceylon and Burma I compared these accounts with the interpretation given to the doctrines as by the living followers of his religion. Learned monks in these countries approach the subject with an accuracy of knowledge at least equal to that of the most advanced Orientalists, but their interpretation of the doctrines is very far less wooden and lifeless. By far the best book in English to give one a real idea of the religion, as it is held by living men as the light of Asia, by Sir Edwin Arnold, and another book, which makes a good second, to it, is the soul of a people, by H. Fielding Hall. Some critics have said that Sir Edwin Arnold has gone little beyond the bare literal meaning of the words of the text, and is trying to read Christian ideas into them. I do not think this is so, and I have certainly found that he expresses far more closely the feeling and attitude of the Buddhists than any other writer. 237. Buddhism is now divided into two great churches, the northern and the southern, and both of them have departed to some extent from the original teaching of the Buddha, though in different directions. The religion is so plain and straightforward, and so obviously common sense, that almost any person may readily adapt himself to it, 
without necessarily giving up the beliefs and practices of other faiths. As a consequence of this in the Northern Church we have a form of Buddhism with an immense amount of accretion. It seems to have absorbed into itself many ceremonies and beliefs of the Aboriginal faith which it supplanted, so that in Tibet, for example, we find it including a whole hierarchy of minor deities, devas, and demons which were entirely unknown to the original scheme of the Buddha. The Southern Church, on the other hand, instead of adding to the teaching of the Buddha, has lost something from it. It has intensified the material and the abstract sides of the philosophy. 238. It teaches that nothing but karma passes over from life to life, that there is no permanent ego in man, but that in his next birth he is in effect a new man, who is the result of the karma of the previous life, and they quote various sayings of the Buddha in support of this. It is true that he often spoke very strongly against the persistence of the personality, and that he assured his hearers again and again that nothing whatever which they knew in connection with a man could pass over to another birth. But he nowhere denied the individuality, in fact many of his absolutely affirm it. Take for example a text which occurs in the Samana Felicita of the Diganakaya, when first mentioning the condition and training of the mind that are necessary for success in spiritual progress, the Buddha describes how he sees all the scenes in which he was in any way concerned passing in succession before his mind si. He illustrates it by saying, 239. If a man goes out from his own village to another, and thence to another, and from there comes back again to his own village, he may think thus, back, quote, I indeed went from my own village to that other. There I stood thus, I sat in this manner, thus I spoke, and thus I remained silent. From that village again I went to another, and I did the same there. The same back, quote, I am returned from that village to my own village. In the very same way, O King, the ascetic, when his mind is pure, knows his former births. He thinks, back quote, in such a place I had such a name. I was born in such a family, such was my caste, such was my food, and in such and such a way I experienced pleasure and pain, and my life extended through in some other place, and there also I had such and such conditions. Thence removed, the same back quote I am now born here. 240. This question shows very clearly the doctrine of the Buddha with regard to the reincarnating ego. He gives illustrations also in the same Sutta of the manner in which an ascetic can know the past births of others, how he can see them die in one place, and after the sorrows and joys of hell and heaven the same men are born again somewhere else. It is true that in the Brahmajala Sutta he mentions all the various aspects of the soul, and says that they do not absolutely exist because their existence depends upon contact, that is to say upon relation. But in thus denying the absolute reality of the soul he agrees with the other great Indian teachers, for the existence not only of the soul, but even of the Logos himself is true only relatively. 241. Untrained minds frequently misunderstand these ideas, but the careful student of Oriental thought will not fail to grasp exactly what is meant, and to realize that the teaching of the Buddha in this respect is exactly that now given by Theosophy. It is not difficult to see how various texts might be so emphasized or distorted as to seem to contradict one another and the Southern Church has chosen to cling rather to the denial of the permanence of the personality than to the assertion of the continuity of the individuality, just as in Christianity some people have acquired the habit of laying stress on particular texts and ignoring others which contradict them.